Hello everyone, welcome back. In the second part for this week's video, we're going to explore a more melodic approach to sonifying uh, data. Uh, and by that I mean uh, we're going to map the data to specific uh, musical notes and try to create a melody from that. So, right, so let's uh, jump back into it. Um, let's turn this background to black here so it's not as blinding. So I've already started by um, remixing the blank sketch here. And uh, just before we dive into uh, this example, we are going to do a couple of things. Uh, first is we are going to import the Tone.js library again, and I'll have the link. Um, I'll have the link in the uh, in the description. Okay? But uh, we are going to put Tone.js over here, so include it as a as another library into our sketch. So that is step one. Okay. And now we're able to create uh, Tone.js objects. So uh, what we're going to do for this example is we are going to um, uh, visualize a data set. And for our data set, we'll talk about it in a minute. Or we're going to use the digits of the number pi. That's basically just going to give us a sequence of numbers that uh, to play with. But really, this could be any. Um, it could be any data set. Uh, it could be you know data coming from a spreadsheet. We've talked about earlier how we can connect to spreadsheets. It could be data coming from an API, doing a query online. So um, these ideas here really apply to any set of numbers. And when we're talking about sonification, um, a big part of the process is coming up with an interesting mapping between uh, the data or the numbers that we're playing with and some kind of sonic elements. So for today's example, we're going to use uh, something a little bit more melodic. And uh, we're going to create an instrument, uh, a sampled instrument using Tone.js. There's a few different ways we could approach this. Um, we could also use Tone.js to create, um, let me open Tone.js here. Uh, we could also use Tone.js to create um, something like a synth. Yeah. So last, in the previous example, we used oscillators. So oscillators are just kind of raw waveforms that uh, allow you to play just any frequency, any tone. Um, something like a synth in Tone.js is um, taking an oscillator, but also added to it adding to it um, envelopes and uh, filters and things like that and create something that's a little bit more like a, a, a like a, the physical synth like that has a piano and you can play specific notes of the of, in, um, uh, on the piano so you could use a synth to do something like that but today instead of a synth we are going to use um, a, a sampler okay so a sampler is a is an object in tone.js that we can use to load um, several sound samples representing different musical notes, and uh, then we'll be able to tell it to play back those notes uh, depending on which um, note we want to hear. Okay? And uh, one of the cool things about it, although we're not going to take huge advantage of that today, but we will a little bit, uh, one of the cool things about this is that you can give it just a, a selection of notes and the sampler will automatically repitch to fill in the blanks. So if you try to play notes that you did not explicitly provide when you created your sampler, let's say you only have um, a few different octaves and then a few notes in between, you'll be able to play um, all the notes uh, just by that are in between samples by, by using this uh, automatic repitching process. So this kind of cool feature. So we're going to use this sampler object and then we need some kind of sample to work with. Uh, there's a ton of free samples that can be found online. I mean, you could create your own if you're very motivated. Uh, this is a, one of the resources I like. Uh, this is a website called Piano Book that has a, a big collection of all kinds of sampled instruments. <clears throat> and um, this is one uh, that I that I searched for. Uh, I looked for a music box and I found there were a few, uh, a few options. If I just hit back here, there were, you know, quite a few results here for a music box. And I found this one. Now, uh, on Piano Book, samples will come in a few different formats. Um, there's uh, formats like the Contact Player or Sound Fonts, uh, but this particular one has raw samples, and quite a few of them have uh, raw samples as well. So this is perfect for us because we need just some uh, WAV uh, files for the individual notes in our instrument. So I've already downloaded this uh, music box sample, and there's you know a little story that comes to it with it and so forth. And uh, these are the files that I got from the music box download. So what we have to play with here are um, these WAV files. And next to them, we can see there's uh, letters and names. Those are the notes that are being represented by each file. So for example, if we play um, the D2 here, 
It sounds like this. So this is a, a D2, and this would be the next note over, uh, E3. E3. Oops, E2, sorry. So there are different notes sampled on this uh, music box. So we're going to use these to create an instrument in Tone.js. Now these letters, uh, those of you not um, too musically inclined, we're not going to go in depth here in terms of covering uh, how this works, but um, these are representing notes on the piano keyboard. Okay? So <clears throat> we have C, right? This is usually the first note in the major scale. And then um, we have the white keys, right? Are just letters. And then the black keys are either sharps or flat, depending on how you look at them. And uh, we can see this reflected here in the files that we have. Okay, so we have, for example, we have a D, we have an E, an F sharp, a G, an A, a B, and then a C sharp. Okay, so those are the notes that we have to play with. And the number next to them refers to the octave. Okay? So the D as the D1 is the lower octave. And then the D2, somewhere in the middle. And then the D3 is a higher octave up. So looking at these notes, um, I was able to figure out that what we have is we have two octaves of, um, of a scale called the D major scale. So what is a scale? Well, a scale, if this is like all the possible notes that can be played in Western music, a scale is a subset of these notes that sound good together. And there's lots of different scales. Um, and without going into music theory, uh, there's some great resources. If you look for scale generators online, um, you can pick a root note. Though. So here we have D, and then you can choose. There's many more than these three, but these are the most common. We have major scales and two different types of minor scales. Um, and these uh, sites will generate the scale notes for you. So if you want to explore that in, um, in your exercise or in uh, kind of move going further with today's example, uh, you can just do a Google search for some scales and come up with basically uh, sequences of notes that will um, play, kind of create interesting tones together. So that sample instrument that we're playing with, the music box, um, that particular music box was able to play a D major scale. And we can see we have all the notes of that scale here. We have a D and E, right? Our F sharp, G, A, B, C, and C sharp. So this is how we know that our uh, instrument is in D major. Uh, but that said, you know, with these um, samples, remember that the, the sampler can do pitch shifting. So we could play any note, right? Any of these notes, any scale with some, um, some pitch shifting happening between samples of the scale here uh, if we wanted to. But because this is a music box, like you'll, if you listen, there's these like interesting little mechanical noise. So we're not gonna rely on the pitch shifting too much. Uh, instead, we're going to put in all of the notes for a full octave of the scale, and then we're going to use that to generate uh, melodies. Okay, enough talking. Let's uh, put that into practice. So we are going to jump back into our sketch here, and the first thing we're going to do is bring in some asset files. <clears throat> so I'm going to grab um, the first oc the middle octave that we have to play. I guess we have two octaves. So I'm going to grab from D2 to D3 which means I'm going to need D2, E2, F sharp 2, G2, A2, B2, C sharp 2, and then D3, okay? So this is all the notes of the scale starting from D2 and then ending on D3, one octave above. And I could use both octaves, but um, for this example, I'm just going to grab these uh, eight notes and upload them to Glitch. Okay. So now we have a bunch of files here. And uh, what we're going to have to do is connect those to our sampler. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and connect uh, these to the sampler. So we're going to create a variable. Let's call it um, music box. Okay, that's going to be our sampler. And in setup, we're going to say music box equals new tone dot sampler. And now we have, um, so the parameter here is going to be a, an object, and it's going to have a few attributes. And there's a few different ways we can load the sampler. Uh, if we look at the example, so it's providing in here um, a map here called URLs, and then this has these key value pairs to it. So on the one side, we have the note, and then this is the file that represents that note. Okay. Uh, we can see they also have, they provide an attribute here called base URL, 
So if we could just simply load files from a base URL, we could do that and then just provide the name of the file here that would go at the end of that URL. That's an option. Um, but on Glitch, uh, because of the way Glitch work with assets, we are going to have to, you know, starting with D2 here, I'm going to have to kind of manually copy all of these assets anyways. So this base URL is optional here. We could just put in the, the full link here that matches with the note we want to play. So for example, I'm going to say URLs. And then in here, we're going to say D2 is going to be equal to this file. Okay, so I just pasted that from my asset. You can see in there, this is the, the D2. Okay. So we have D2 is equal to that file. And now what I have to do, oh, it's a comma here, not a semicolon. What I have to do is do all the other eight notes of my scale. Okay, so we know we're going to have D2. I have a, now the F sharp, uh, I cannot just write it like that. So these are going to have to become strings in my case. Okay. <clears throat> Oops. Do it like this. E2. Uh, we are going to have, let's do them one at a time. I'm going to try to do this as quickly as possible. Um, if you want, uh, I'll have a timestamp to when I'm done with this. Uh, so if you, want, if you want to skip ahead, please do that. Um, I am just going to quickly copy and paste all of the files into this. Uh, this is the most tedious part of this uh, example. So we have G2, that's the next note. G2, copy. Then we have A2. B2, almost there. Where is it? B2. Then we have a C sharp 2. Here it is. And we're not going to go up to the octave to D3. Again, we didn't have to do that. I mean, I could have chose any other combination of notes or some other sample. Uh, instruments might have other notes available to it. Um, and uh, I'll show you the uh, the pitch interpolation in a second, just to show you what it does. Okay, so now we've loaded um, all of our URLs. Okay. Let's hit refresh here and open the console, make sure we don't have errors. Okay, we're good. You can see uh, Tone.js is being loaded here, that's great. And um, for what we need, this is all, all we have to provide. Um, there are some other things you can define here, like um, an onload callback. So if you wanted something to run, so here they are triggering the sound as soon as it loads. Uh, we're not going to bother with that. <clears throat> okay. And then just like with the oscillators, we're going to connect our Tone.js object to the speakers by saying to destination. And um, so let's let's test it and see that it works. So we are going to put in a mouse pressed here. And when I click the mouse, I'm going to play a note at random. Okay. Now I need to tell this, uh, actually, let's start with just playing a D2, just play a note. Okay. So our music box here, we're going to say, so if we go back to the dock, the way that we can trigger notes is using the trigger attack release function. So attack release in um, kind of synth terms, this refers to the envelope of the sound. And those can be tweaked. Um, they can, their properties we can set. We're just going to use the defaults here. Um, and, uh, but basically, it, in other words, this means uh, trigger a note with an attack and release envelope. And uh, we're gonna say which note we wanna play, let's say D2. And then the other argument is gonna be the time. Okay, so we're going to say play that note for one second. So now when I'm clicking, we can hear a D2. I could play a D3, right? Or I could play any other note that we have, like G2. 
And because uh, this sampler will do pitch shifting, it will play notes that are not part of these samples. For example, um, I don't have a D sharp two. Okay, I have a D two, but I don't have a D sharp two. Right? But it can still play it. If I refresh here, you hear the D sharp. So it's taken a sample that it had that was the closest to that note and it pitch shifted it so that it's the correct tone. Okay? So in theory, we could have given it just like one, you know, the more sample you, you give it, the better the pitch shifting will sound. But we could have given him just D2 and D3 and we could figure out, we could have it play all the notes in between. Um, with the music box samples, though, it's not great because of those little mechanical noises. They get repetitive really quickly. So it's kind of nice to have the variety of sounds to play with here um, so that the, the noises that are part of the sound file are a little bit more diverse. But anyways, so just to show you that this is something you can do with the sampler object. Uh, you don't need to have every note if you want to experiment with changing the scale a little bit or uh, trying, trying different things. <clears throat> okay, so what about playing a note at random? Well, we could... Um, we could, you know, this is how we pass it a note. So we could say, if this is our D major scale, let's define an array here. Let's call it the, the scale. And we're simply going to put in all the notes that are, that are possible to play from our music box. Okay. Uh, let's just call this uh, notes because it may not end up being a scale in the end. So what I'm going to do here is just enter in, uh, again, the notes that we have, but this time I'm putting them in an array. And the reason I'm doing that is because that's going to make it easy to um, pick out elements of using an index. I'll show you what I mean in a second. Okay, so now I've created this array here with uh, the eight notes that we have. So for example, if I wanted to play a note at random every time I press my mouse, I could say uh, random note equals random notes. So one of the things that we can do in P5 or JavaScript is we can, um, the random function, if you give it an array as its input, it will select a random value from that array and return the result. So now we can say random note. So every time I click here, I'm clicking my mouse, you can't see, but I'm getting random notes uh, from this array that I've defined. And if I went in and changed those notes, of course I would be randomly getting other notes. Yep. All right, so now we have something that we can play with. Uh, we have an instrument that can play notes. Okay. So let's bring this back to the idea of uh, sonification. So again, in order to sonify some data, uh, we need data to work with. So I thought for this example, uh, it would be fun to play with uh, something a little bit more abstract. So we're going to take um, the digits of pi. Okay, so pi, as you know, the number pi, um, has kind of this infinite sequence of digit past the, the decimal point uh, that can be computed, and uh, some people have, of course. And this website over here has these uh, data sets where you can get, you know, the 10 digits of pi up to uh, 100 thousand digits of pi here and then of course if you wanted a million digits of pi that might be a little bit overkill for our example uh, because that will take quite a while to go through all these digits uh, they even provide you with links of where to get your hands on uh, billions or trillions of digits of pi if you were so inclined for example let's grab this uh, data set here just ten thousand digits of pi that should be good enough to get us going so <clears throat> i'm simply going to bring this and <laughs> copy and paste this as a string and we're going to take a bit of a quick approach here for this demonstration and um, call that uh, digits of pi and we're going to simply represent it as a string okay? that is 10,000 characters long at home to get back to the beginning and uh, let's get rid of this dot here okay so I could have just as well put that into a spreadsheet, for example, um, you know, this could be, again, data coming from a Google Sheet. We saw how to do this. This could be a stream of data coming from some API query like the weather. So um, the point here is just to give us a sequence of numbers that we are then going to turn into musical notes. Okay. So I thought we would use uh, Pi as uh, just a material to work with. 
<clears throat> so uh, we can start as a string. And if we want to access the individual um, numbers inside that string, the um, all we have to do is uh, is ax we can access the string as an array. So the first number as index zero, the second number as index one, and so forth. So if we wanted to, like for example, play through this uh, array here, we could um, let's create an index. Let's call it uh, pi index. And uh, when we press the mouse here, instead of grabbing a random note, we could say <clears throat> Let's just call this note. We are going to grab instead. Um, we are going to grab from the notes and we are going to use, um, well, let's put that into a variable first. So let's call this digit. We're going to say digit equal digits of pi, pi index. Then we will put, we will use the digit that we extracted from the number pi as an index into our uh, notes array up here. Okay? And then that will become the note that we play, and then we will play that note. And then once we're done playing it, we're going to increase the index by one. And if pi index ever increases the number of um, notes that we have, or digits of pi dot length, well, we will just go back to zero. Okay? And uh, remember, we have 10,000, so that's going to take a little while. <clears throat> now, um, if you're paying close attention, you're going to notice that um, there are 10 possible digits, right, in a number. It could be 0 to 9, okay? but we only have uh, 8, eight uh, notes in this array in our scale. We've only loaded 8 notes. We go from D2 to D3, an octave higher, and there is typically 7 notes in a scale. Um, so what can we do? Well, we could just add two more notes to this. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to pick notes that are already in the scale, but I'm just going to go like one octave lower. And the pitch sampler engine is going to, the pitch shifting engine is going to create those notes for us, even though we don't have the samples. So in addition to this um, D major scale, like kind of in, in that octave, we're also going to put in uh, a D1, so a D1 octave lower. And uh, I don't know, let's say a G1, a G one octave lower. So the G here being uh, the fourth <clears throat> in the scale. So I don't know, I could have picked any other notes, but this way we're going to have uh, some, so here, if we get a number zero in the pi sequence, it's going to play that note, right? And if we get number nine, it's going to play that note and every note in between. So we could tweak that and we'll get um, different results in our melody, of course. But the point here is now I have as many notes, as many possible notes as uh, as data uh, elements, individual data elements. Uh, I could have also done a mapping process to kind of refine that and map it to a smaller or a greater uh, array of notes, although greater doesn't really make sense in this case. So let's listen to it. Uh, so now I, whenever I press the mouse, So we are now going through, and we could log here. Um, we could lo log the digit that we are uh, playing. So we are going through the digits of pi and mapping them to notes of this scale. So pretty neat. But also let's um, let's start building a little bit of um, a visualization that's going to go with this at the same time. Uh, let's set the text align to center, and we are also going to draw this digit instead of logging it into the console. Right, this is our digit that we are currently drawing. We're going to draw it in the center of the screen, and uh, set the text size maybe a little bit bigger too. 48. <clears throat> All right, so this is our sound sequence. Um, and of course, we could 
take this in many different directions. For example, we could decide that um, instead of uh, doing, you know, now we're only incrementing on the mouse pressed, we could just have the code play this, um, you know, every certain number of frames, we could increment the index, and then it would kind of robotically play through all the notes of the, of the number pi, right, and just create this ongoing melody. Um, I thought what would be fun to create for this example is uh, create a bit of an interesting interaction for the viewer. So because this is a, a music box and it sounds like a music box, um, let's add an interaction where instead of clicking to advance the melody, um, we're going to use a gesture that's closer to what you would do with a music box when you turn the crank. Uh, so here I have a mouse with a wheel. So we are going to do the mouse wheel, right? Whenever I turn my mouse wheel, it's going to go to the next note. And we'll also be able to crank it back by uh, rolling the wheel in the other direction. Uh, that gesture is also going to work on a trackpad. So as you scroll, basically a scrolling gesture, right? You were going to be scrolling through notes of the digits of pi and sonifying them. So if, uh, so let's park that for now here, the mouse pressed event. So we don't get confused. So if you wanted to access the scroll wheel events, we could use the uh, mouse wheel function. And the mouse wheel function has a event parameter. <clears throat> and this event here uh, has a delta attribute. So let's see what that looks like. That might be different on your computer. Uh, I haven't tested this with other mice, to be honest. Uh, I've only used the mouse I have here, or I haven't used other trackpads. But what I'm getting on this computer is every time I scroll the wheel, I'm getting a delta of 100. Okay? So if I go up, I'm, I'm getting minus 100. And if I go down, I'm getting plus 100. So what that tells me is that the mouse wheel events are expressed in um, in kind of changes because the wheel is an, it turns infinitely, right? Uh, the delta means a kind of a change in position, and because my wheel has kind of a clicky feel to it, it changes an increment of 100, whatever that is. Uh, so we're going to use that to keep track of um, where the the wheel is, where the the track is, or the, the the this imaginary crank, where we are in the in the digit over time. Okay? So let's create a variable. Let's call it pass for um, crank position. Okay? And what we'll do here is uh, over time, we're going to add this event.delta to our position. So now I'm going to log in the console the position. So if I scroll up, I can go negative, and if I scroll down, we can see that we have this number increasing. Okay. So this is neat because um, I can use this number, right? This can almost become my index. If I divide it by 100, this can become my index straight into the, um, the pi array, right? the, the digits of pi string, so I know which note to play. Um, I don't want to go negative here. I don't want to go past zero because zero is the first letter in the string. So we're going to add a little extra check and balances here. And we'll say, if we ever go negative, just cap it, right? Just stay at zero. So that now, uh, even if I scroll up, right, I cannot go past zero. I can go more than zero, but I cannot go past zero. Cool. <clears throat> okay. So on my computer, those increases are in perfect steps of 100. Um, if you have a laptop, a laptop with a trackpad or maybe an Apple Magic Mouse, I'm actually not sure what these values would be. So just in case, um, we're going to add a little bit of code that's going to keep track of <clears throat> where the previous position was. Okay? Call this previous position. And then we are going to compare, kind of like we did um, with the change count in the previous example, we are going to compare these two values. We're going to say if position minus previous position. So we want to look at the gap between them. And uh, because we could be going in either direction, meaning we could be going from positive to negative or negative to positive, and we're only interested in the gap, I'm going to take the absolute value of this gap. Okay, so to get rid of the sign, and if that gap is greater or equal to 100, okay, so if we made a jump of 100, then we will trigger a note. Okay. 
then we will also make the previous position equal to the position. <clears throat> so every time we jump by at least 100, we will trigger a new note. And we will say pi index is going to simply be equal to the position divided by 100. Now, again, just in case the position increase is not always 100, like what if we had 400, uh, 510 here? Right? We don't want a decimal point here for our pi index. So I will take the floor of this value, which gets rid of the decimal point. <clears throat> so now we have this other method of incre increasing the pi index, and we can see that it works by testing with the console. Let's make sure we're on the right track here. So now I can go zero, and I can go up, down, and this is going to cycle me through the digits of the uh, digits of pi that we have in our string. Um, <clears throat> so from here, uh, we can play our note, right? We already know how to do that. We've done that over here. So okay. like so. Now, it is possible the position will kind of overflow at some point as well. Like we had this test here. Um, so let's see if uh, if that happens. Again, you'd have to really like scroll for a while to go through 10,000 digits. But um, if that happens, we can take care of this. We can say if pi index is greater or than um, digits of pi dot length, then we will simply reset the position back to zero. Okay. So let's hear what that sounds like. So now this is interesting because I have a little bit more control over, I've basically given the user the control of the time element of this sonification. As I turn my virtual crank or turn my mouse cursor, I mean, if we, uh, you could build a physical interface for this, it would be way cooler, but beyond the scope of this little example, um, I can still cycle through the sequence of numbers, but now I can control how that happens. And I can. Go back to the beginning, right, and still play through. Uh, still play through the notes. All right, so pretty cool. Now, um, since we do have uh, <clears throat> the uh, the position here, um, it would be kind of cool also to create a little um, kind of a little visualization for our virtual crank, just so it becomes a little bit more apparent what we're doing. So we're going to do this last, and then we're going to wrap it up here for this um, this lesson. <clears throat> so let's uh, let's try this. So we're going to translate. Um, I'm going to translate the origin to the center of the screen here, right? And since uh, this is a visualization of the number pi, it makes sense to throw in some some rotations in there. Um, we're going to draw our text at zero zero now instead. Okay, there it is. And um, <clears throat> let's draw a circle. So we're going to draw, um, here. let's create a variable here that's going to define the diameter of a circle. Uh, let's set that to a third of the width. So we're going to draw a circle, at zero, zero, okay, like so. And then um, let's draw a black circle in the center of that, so we can see our text again, and uh, at zero, zero again, and that one is going to be, um, let's say, a fourth of the diameter, something like this. And um, we should probably align the text here, center as well, on the vertical axis. Perfect. <clears throat> Uh, 
Okay. And then um, what I want to do is I want to draw a smaller, um, let me see, a smaller, uh, a smaller circle that's going to just kind of rotate around as we turn the crank. So how would we do this? Well, now we've translated over here. Um, we could figure out basically translate our way over up there. So I'm going to translate. Uh, so first, I'm going to do use a push because I don't want these translates to affect the the center elements of my um, interface here. So I'm going to use push and pop. And then um, from there, we are going to uh, translate by uh, zero and then a certain amount here. So let's figure out this is going to be a ratio of our diameter. Um, so let's say diameter divided by two, where does that put us? Let's draw black circle at zero zero and um, that guy is small as well over here i'm gonna add another fraction here try to move it my goal, okay, perfect. So I'm, I'm basically using just fractions of the size of my circle to figure out how to position things correctly. Um, this guy is too small, too, in the middle. It's two divided by two. Okay, that's nice. And then maybe um, this divided by four one, we're gonna make it just a little bit smaller so it doesn't touch. So now what I'm going to do is every time I move the cursor, uh, I'm going to just apply a rotation so that it's making its way around the circle. So we're going to rotate and we're going to use the, um, the position, right? The position variable that we're updating over here. Uh, we're going to use that as an angle. <clears throat> so this is kind of arbitrary, um, but experiments here. So we're going to say, take the position, we're going to divide it by 100. And um, let's multiply that by five. And that's going to be, we'll get an angle in degrees, we're going to convert it to radians. So every time I increase position, it's increasing this angle. Um, I've kind of come up with some arbitrary number here. I mean, we could change this, right? And then that would make it slower to turn, or we could multiply by a greater number. It would make it quicker. Okay. So um, that seemed like a good kind of balance here. Amount of degrees to increase by uh, every time I rotate uh, my mouse wheel. Okay. I can also go backwards because the position variable can decrease and it will get stuck at the top because it cannot go below zero. And because it's an angle, um, if this increases more than a full circle, it will keep going, right? So that's kind of neat. Cool. <clears throat> so this was just, the idea here was just to create a simple like little visual representation of what was happening. Just like in the previous example, um, we had our sonification layer and then we also had some visuals so it can be nice to combine the two or at least to give a bit of a hint to the user as to what's happening um, <clears throat> so just to recap right we've taken the digits of pi the first uh, 10,000 to be exact and we're doing a really simple data sonification where we are playing through the digits of pi array uh, using the mouse wheel or the scroll gesture as an interface right every time I scroll it's like I'm virtually turning a crank on a music box and we are translating every digit of pi into a musical note um, from this D major scale. And then we're playing those using a sampler instrument from Tone.js that uses uh, music box samples we found online. So 
I could spend hours doing this. Um, and uh, so I'm not going to do that, but uh, feel free to play around with it. Now, for the code exercise this week, um, I would encourage you to try a few different things. I mean, the as usual, you can take it in many different directions, but we, we saw two approaches this week to sonifying data. Uh, the first one we saw in the previous example was taking numbers and then um, mapping those to kind of direct elements of some kind of sound generator. So the example we gave was we had some oscillators and we directly tweaked their frequencies and tweaked the parameters of effects we applied to them, like a tremolo and changed the frequency of that effect. And that was a kind of a direct one-to-one -one correlation between the data and uh, almost like the physical properties of the sound. So that could be something to explore. Um, as far as what data to use, um, like I said, I suggest you could revisit an earlier code example you've created and um, use just add a sound layer to it um, as an exercise. The other approach, uh, like we did in this video, is to go a little bit more melodic, and that creates more of a layer of interaction between the data and the sonification output. Uh, so what we're doing here is kind of creating our own mapping where we're saying, okay, this element of my data is going to map into this note. Right? And uh, these notes have been chosen to fit within a scale so that we get musical uh, results. And you could imagine, you know, layers of this, if you had a more complex data set, we could have multiple of these playing in parallel, for example, starting to create chords perhaps, or more, maybe more interesting melodies. Um, there's probably other strategies you could explore, kind of trying to bring rhythm into the equation, although that starts to get a little bit more complex. Um, but if you're interested in a more melodic angle, I would suggest maybe trying to find a different um, sampled instrument to bring in, come up with a scale of your own choosing, and then try to find some data to map it to. All right, so hopefully you have some fun with this uh, code exercise. It is the last one for the semester. And um, yeah, I will, uh, otherwise I will see you in uh, the next video. There'll be one more video next week, a short one, and then uh, we're done for the P5JS lessons um, for this course. All right, take care, everybody.